Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the IGIS Institute National Symposium for 2021. Uh, I appreciate your patience in our starting a couple of minutes late. Uh, as some of you who were joining us yesterday may know, we had some connectivity issues. Uh, the East Coast has a little bit of a storm going on. Um, those are all fun stories that I would tell you on a break or I would tell you um, during lunch if we were all in person, but unfortunately that will have to wait for our next in-person event. Uh, suffice it to say that we are very grateful that you are participating with us today um, and that you have been able to join us and dedicate some of your time. Uh, I'm gonna spend about five minutes on a brief introduction uh, I'm going to review a little bit about yesterday's accomplishments. I'm going to line up what is the uh, the plan for today, which is an extraordinary lineup of individuals. Uh, I'm going to chat about uh, some of the uh, the committee report outs. We're actually going to present uh, what will be six very short videos, all um, representing about 10 or 15 minutes from each of the, the, the committee chairs on all of the accomplishments of late. And then we will have the pleasure of hearing our first keynote speaker. So as you may recall, uh, the agenda for the two-day event uh, focused on two key priorities and themes from a national perspective. Of course, the, four, the first day was about uh, the collective response to the pandemic. Uh, the second, of course, will be the, uh, the need for the cries for uh, public safety or reform. And I'll, I'll make the distinction between reform and public safety reform a little bit later. Uh, know that yesterday uh, we focused on uh, the pandemic response. We had our Ernie Owens, who was former assistant, ass assistant secretary for uh, HHS, uh, that spoke to us about the national picture, uh, the experiences that the administration had with the challenges of the pandemic, uh, the, the vast array of complex issues that they dealt with, uh, the, the mitigation strategies that they put in place. Uh, we followed that with a town hall that then brought together various domains uh, and they shared their experiences from the practical side. So we brought together education representatives, brought together social service representatives. We had uh, another individual representing human services, health and human services as well. And we had uh, public safety represented. And uh, you'll recall that in a past gathering that I just put on the mid-year briefing in August, we started with other domains and how they dealt with the pandemic. Uh, not a year later, but six to eight months later, of course, the, the challenges continue, the burden continues, the burden burnout continues, but what we thought was a value to share with you today were the resulting themes. So all of the different domains came to the table with what their experience had been and how they responded within their individual jurisdictions and some of the solutions they put to the table, which included some industry solutions as well. Uh, multifaceted problems, dynamic change management issues. Uh, if, there, if, there's a if there is a reluctancy for change in and of itself within our justice community, Obviously, the pace with which this pandemic has required changes uh, is an enormous burden on the system, uh, both figuratively and literally, uh, on the human beings and on the ability to adapt uh, in order to still provide what are the operational outputs from each of the domains that participated. The policy changes, the regulatory changes, the authorities, as it was made reference to, on the federal level, the state level, the local levels, as we all know from so many of these information sharing efforts uh, are all vastly different. And to that end, even those changes were a burden to try to move. The communication challenges, uh, be they within a individual domain or agency, because things were changing so rapidly, uh, be it with other partners at the table, say from public safety to health and human safety, uh, to health and human services, or be it even to our largest constituency, which are the community members uh, that we don't have, we don't yet have, uh, what are very easy ways to communicate with them. So that, of course, was another burden that nearly all of our stakeholders experienced. Uh, the resulting sort of responses was that it all needed to be comprehensive in its solution. It all needed to bring together pivotal and critical partners. It all needed to be guided by a framework 
that addressed policy, that addressed change, that addressed technical issues, that addressed communication, uh, that prioritized the critical needs. Uh, that's not uh, sort of earth shattering. The, the, um, the themes that we found yesterday, no doubt will be resident and will be front and center on some of the discussions that we have today. What was uh, of critical value is that the amount of change and responses and ultimate progress that each of these jurisdictions and domains made in their own right and collectively was extreme and was significant. Uh, what all of us are hoping to, uh, to ensure is that the accomplishments and the progress that individual agencies or domains or programs made uh, become codified. We learn from those lessons. We share those lessons because even on the pandemic side and on the reform side, None of these things are going away and all will take uh, different flavors and facets in different jurisdictions and states. Um, one of the, the, the great values of IGIS, and I mentioned this uh, during one of our discussions yesterday, is that uh, fundamental to our success, fundamental to really our domain success, is the critical partnerships that we bring together. Uh, it is the stakeholders, it is the industry, it is the public, it is the community. Uh, all of those critical issues are absolutely uh, fundamental to success in these programs. So with all that said, uh, what we did yesterday in the trilogy version of keynote speaker, uh, town hall discussion, and then industry slash practitioner panel uh, is the same format that we're going to use for you today. And that will be in the area of uh, public safety reform. And the, the, the notion that I'll touch on uh, is that the definition of reform in and of itself warrants a discussion and a baseline agreement, uh, depending upon the solution that folks are looking to put in hand. Uh, ultimately, we will need to be able to uh, baseline whether we're talking about police reform, public safety reform, justice reform, maybe all of which we absolutely need, but for each discussion, for each solution, we need to be able to scope that. Uh, we'll chat about that a little bit later, uh, but I do want to introduce and spend maybe another 10 minutes on what has been the progress from an IGIS community and IGIS organizational perspective. Uh, I mentioned yesterday uh, that part of the partnerships that we put into play are realized in what are six advisory committees. Uh, and though those are relatively uh, foundational to our mission, uh, they can evolve. They do have additional subcommittees working for it, working groups, task forces, et cetera, that then given the priorities that both uh, public sector and private sector agree to as to the criticality of the notion, they will then develop and stand up some of these working groups in order to produce deliverables uh, that have been sought from the constituents. Uh, so that could be an RMS functional specification document. That could be a policy on how to deal with uh, law enforcement or public safety data in the cloud. Uh, that could be issues related to corrections and courts. Uh, the accomplishments of each of these groups uh, cannot be underscored as to how significant it is. Uh, not only is it, uh, you'll see from the, the chair's discussion, not only is it significant because of what they produced, uh, but when you're reminded of the fact that each of these contributors in their own right are dedicating their own time to this as a volunteer mission, uh, that is even more stark in its, in its uh, accomplishments. So uh, we're gonna spend, we're actually gonna present uh, two, group, two groupings of these videos. Uh, the first grouping of video, and again, they're very short, but they're very um, content ridden, uh, is, will include the courts advisory committee, the corrections advisory committee, and our CGIS committee. Joe Wheeler is the chair of our courts committee. Um, I won't sort of uh, give away the keys to the castle and let them discuss their individual details, uh, but he has been an extraordinary uh, leader in that field, again, in and of his own right, and then put him with what are other extraordinary SMEs uh, and practitioners and industry within that committee. They've done some great things that he'll chat with you about. Fred Roselle is his equal in the corrections field. Um, he represents Marquis. Uh, but he has years and years of experience uh, on the practitioner side, and he too has led the group and the advisory committee on some extraordinary accomplishments. 
And lastly, in this first grouping of videos will be Jim Pingle, who leads our Aegis group. Um, and he will be able to chat with you about all the, the accomplishments that they have uh, brought together. So, uh, Alex, if you are ready with the video, we will uh, part momentarily and you'll get to hear from directly from the advisory committee chairs. Hi folks, I'm Joe Wheeler, Chair of the IGES Coordinating
I would uh, give all of our chairs that spoke to us a virtual thanks. I hope that some of them are online and able to join us and saw the, uh, the results of their dedication. Um, that being said, the, the, uh, the interesting concept that was, um, was obvious, at least to me, uh, in the three report outs and will be in the next three report outs is that you'll see that many of the activities that the advisory groups focus on are both short and long term. We have what are the quick hits uh, that give uh, sort of a, uh, a quick output or deliverable that then goes to the user community. And then we have the longer term strategic issues like that person centric data model uh, that Jim just recently made reference to the last video uh, that will have implications and actually could be aligned to the reform issues and data collection issues there. So uh, again, the, the IGES mission is not about uh, the quick hits. It is about the long term strategic uh, involvement and hopefully influence in order to uh, to to support what are the greater outcomes. Uh, so to that end, I think that you will see those same type of patterns in our next three report outs. Uh, they include the emergency communications emergency response group. Uh, Ed Craig, the chair of that committee, will uh, speak to us. I will tell you that for those uh, that joined us yesterday, you'll recall that that is an additional or a recent uh, addition to our collection of committees. And that was um, developed as a result of the pandemic. Uh, what are traditional PSAPs uh, that classically are known for needing to be in a, in a specific building with specific security concerns with the specific network, et cetera. Uh, of course, in the pandemic had to relook at I had to revisit all of its operational issues and redefine the paradigm. Um, they're doing great work and we'll hear a little bit more detail on that. Bob Turner from our law enforcement advisory committee will tell you the many uh, different tasks and accomplishments of his group. Uh, and Anil Sharma uh, will also chat with us about the information technology advisory group uh, that is dealing with a lot of issues that impact our constituents. Uh, so to that end, I will let Alex uh, bring you up to speed on a couple of more videos and we will get to the program. Alex, you with us? Hi, I'm Ed Craig, Chair of the IGES Emergency Communication and Response Advisory Committee. The goal of the committee is to understand the needs of the public safety and first responder community and specifically how those needs can be addressed by emergency communications and response technologies. The committee is made up of a diverse set of individuals that come not only from industry, but also are practitioner field, in their fields as well. Through this diversity, we're better able to understand uh, what exists today, what processes are in place, and what the needs are of the emergency communication centers and how technology may assist them. Uh, we're looking at not just technology gaps, but also gaps that may exist within process, gaps that may exist from a budget perspective, and where state and federal laws may also impact or provide barriers to implementing change. I'm sure you can imagine that this is a very wide area. Uh, the committee stood up a working group uh, this year whose focus was to look at the challenges associated with creating a distributed emergency communication center. The movement of people from one central location out to a distributed environment uh, created some challenges and issues that I don't think anybody was fully aware of and fully prepared to deal with. Uh, the working group spent time interviewing different agencies, understanding those challenges, understanding those needs, and understanding those impacts, and are publishing a white paper here very shortly that will summarize those key challenges and put together uh, some suggestions uh, for future enhancements and best practices and lessons learned. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work uh, with the community and to further our mission uh, as this next year progresses. Hello, this is Bob Turner. I'm the chair of the LAAC or Law Enforcement Advisory Committee for IGES. Uh, in terms of status, in terms of what we're doing, uh, have done in 2020 and what we're doing, what we're doing, what we're doing in 2021, certainly everyone's had the challenges with COVID and there's no need to really go in and revisit the, those issues again. Really, like most committees, we have three major areas that we are working on. First area is the RMS standards effort, which uh, certainly Maria will have talked to you about or will be talking to you about during your presentations today. 
Uh, that's been really probably one of our major efforts and probably one of the one that we're proudest of in terms of a, a advisory committee. Um, you know, this is where we are revamping the original Let's See documents from 2003 with a minor refresh in 2009. This is going to be significant in terms of helping our constituencies, constituency relative to our members within IGES, especially those who are in the CAD and RMS space. The RMS space providers are really the ones that are in the most significant um, benefit from this because often I hear many of them complain to me about the issues of dealing with those old documents and being the go-to uh, place that many, many consultants in the industry go to write RFPs. So we really expect that this uh, document will be transformative and allow us to change what's going on. Second area is LITTF, Law Enforcement Image Technology Task Force, their work on digital evidence. Uh, right now, that's probably our next really big area since uh, RMS standards is going to be winding down. Uh, digital evidence is really looking at how we are going to come up with back best practices and recommendations for capturing evidence such that it will stand up in a court of law. We've already reached out to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Courts Advisory Committee. We had a meeting with uh, Joe Wheeler late last week where we talked about this effort and you know how they could assist us we're still trying to scope what the nature of our activity is but I think we're starting to get a really good handle our groups already put together a good life cycle diagram of understanding digital evidence and its history and we've vetted it with the courts advisory committee I think we've done some really good conversation with them our last area is the CAD RMS interoperability area. This area has kind of uh, gone through a rejuvenation in an attempt to, to really kill it, uh, to be honest with you. Um, the past chair, Scott Pate, uh, my business partner, had run it for the last uh, year or so, really was at a point where he had questions about the viability of it. You know, We brought it forward to our advisory committee, as well as to uh, get some help from uh, ICPC, just committee with Bonnie Locke. And uh, lo and behold, we've got a number of practitioners who are willing to help out. And more importantly, DHS has taken a direct interest in what we're doing, not even realizing there was an issue. And really what we're trying to do here is define standard uh, interchanges for CAD systems to uh, provide closeout information on calls for service to an RMS, as well as being able to have standardized inquiries for standard queries such as name, date of birth, and vehicles and such information into the, uh, into the RMS. Uh, these are really all areas that I think are key importance, and I think they're really fundamental and, and really go to improving uh, the systems and the technology for law. Hello, my name is Anil Sharma, and I'm the chair of the IGES Technology and Architecture Advisory Committee, the ITAC. My co-chair, Colin Evans, and I jointly manage the ITAC. The mission of the ITAC is to provide information to our industry and practitioner regarding technologies, architectures and standards that enable the successful adoption of technology and sharing of information and or in enterprise use of information. The committee focus is on topics that are innovative and emerging and not universally understood within the public sector community. As one might imagine, the ITEC is a mission support community. Last year, we successfully published the technology adoption white paper in December and we continue to work the Technology Spotlight blog series and publish the first blog entry on Rapid DNA. Additionally, we began work on the post-COVID-19 successes, challenges, and recommendation white paper. Our, la our, our work last year was limited severely by the COVID issues that we all are faced with. We had a challenging year to say the least. This year, our plan is to present at five to seven events on the topics of artificial intelligence, blockchain and other emerging technologies, issue a monthly blog entry to the Spotlight blog series, continue, continue collaboration with other com committees on deliverables such as the COVID post-19 white paper. Um, we're also scoping the possibility of standing up an AI task force as the AI issues are becoming more and more germane to our community. Thank you for your time and thank you for attending the IGES Symposium. Thank you all to the chairs and thank you for the attendees um, for watching the videos and hopefully learning a little bit about the progress that has made, been made on each of the, uh, the deliverables and by each of the committee uh, groupings. They've done extraordinary work for us and we are very, very grateful. Uh, so moving on to the program, which is really the meat of, uh, of why you're here. 
Uh, as I mentioned to you before, today we are going to focus on public safety reform. Um, we have what I consider a phenomenal lineup of individuals uh, that will address you. We will, we will present it in the same format, uh, starting with the keynote address, being followed by a town hall forum, being concluded with what is a practitioner slash industry panel. Uh, but let me introduce to you um, the first individual uh, that will be our keynote uh, speaker. I cannot say enough about this individual. Uh, for those of you that have any background in criminal justice, uh, in public safety, um, that are fans of the 21st Century Re Policing Report, uh, that uh, honored and followed the progress within the uh, COPS office in the Department of Justice years ago, um, Ron Davis uh, is an extraordinary asset that I am so very grateful is with us today and uh, is coming back into the forefront of this field. Um, in addition to being the former COPS office director, uh, he was the executive director for the White House Task Force on that 21st Century Policing Report. Uh, he also had, preceding to that, he had 30 years in the law enforcement field, uh, both in Palo Alto and in Oakland uh, PD, Cal uh, California agencies. Uh, and he is currently supporting the transition team for this administration. Uh, I hope that we will hear more about the 21st century policing uh, pillars. Uh, what is interesting to me is as we uh, reviewed what were the lessons learned to the, uh, the guiding themes to the proposed directions of what could be solutions within frameworks, et cetera, uh, it mapped pretty clearly to the pillars uh, that I think we'll ultimately touch on today. So uh, I thank you all for joining us. I'll tell you a little bit uh, later about the subsequent sessions, but Ron, I'm gonna give the floor to you because you have been so very patient uh, and we are so very grateful to have you here today. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, for me, it's good morning to everyone, but good afternoon or good morning. And, and thank you for the invitation. I Really appreciate it. Um, you've helped shape the conversation for me this morning that I, I think I wanna break it into two parts if I can. One, you mentioned public safety reform, but you also mentioned later you were gonna talk about police reform. So if you allow me, I'm gonna do a, a quick piece on police reform um, and then go into public safety reforms. I think they're very much connected. And so you, as you alluded to earlier, when we get to the issue of police reform, we need to start with understanding exactly what are we talking about. I think that's important because too often police reform, in my opinion, um, fails to recognize the, the, the nuances of the American policing system. And what I mean by that is we have to first start with the idea that the American policing system is in fact a system. It is a system with over 16,000 local, state, and tribal law enforcement agencies, with them all reporting to some kind of local governing body, whether it be a city council, a county board of supervisors. So it's a very, it makes us one of the most unique policing systems in the world to have 16,000 independent agencies. And a lot of people are not aware of that the vast majority, some, something close to 70% of those agencies have 50 or fewer officers. So ha here you have this very decentralized system that, that has small components of small independent agencies, right, operating separately from each other. And that's important because it makes us the most unique system in the world, but it also ensures that we have some of the biggest challenge of how to make that a profession. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that the policing system is always challenged with becoming a profession. I, I think of the comment that a, a one of my mentors, the late, great Pat Murphy, and I call him a mentor, he didn't know he was my mentor, the former commissioner of New NYPD, said something at a training I was at, that I was presenting at, and he was at, and he asked, are we a profession or a vocation? And I started thinking about whether or not we're operating as a profession. Do we have a, a, a national coherence to a body of knowledge? Do we operate based on research and evidence? Or are we operating independently? And I think right now it's the latter. And so first understanding that there's a system and like anything else with any system, the system impacts delivery of services more than the individuals. And I embrace the, uh, Edward Deming 8515 rule that 85% of any effectiveness is determined by the SIS team, only 15% is by the individual worker. So once we acknowledge that the American policing system is a system, then we can then move forward with the idea of moving forward with reform. 
The next thing we need to realize is that if we're going to look at it as a system, then we need to change the phrase from police form reform to policing reform. Because too often police reform focuses on the individual officers, the bad apple argument. And that's a very trouble problematic response because it suggests that the issues facing law enforcement are just based on hiring standards and based on having a few bad apples that ruin it for the rest. But once again, if you bridge the concept that policing is a system, then we know it's not simply a bad apple, it's the entire system. The barrel is what's in need of major reform. So instead of saying police reform, we should say policing reform. And I'll give you an example. In New York, when they had the stop and frisk challenge, rank and file officers, the individual officers did not make that decision. They did not create that program. They were trained to do it. They were incentivized to do it. They were held accountable if they didn't make the kind of stops. But as soon as the stops re revealed a disparate treatment, everybody ran quickly to that the officers need more training and not go towards the fact that the police commissioner and the mayor and everyone else was developing a system, adding to a system that in fact required the officer to do exactly what they were doing. So if we're gonna reform law enforcement, then once again, we need to focus on the operational systems. Not to suggest that officers are not accountable for their individual behavior, but if the system is strong enough then it will root out misconduct and hold individual officers that are accountable. But one thing we know about a system, that if you're operating under deficient systems, then good officers can have bad outcomes and bad officers get to operate with impunity and get to hide in that system. And that's what's happening quite frequently with policing in the United States. The other thing is that we have to start, it before we get to public safety reform, we have to start with some hard truths. When I was the COPS director, I used to share with a lot of chiefs, we would do assessments of the organizations that everything starts with the truth, or as Nelson Mandela said, only the truth can put the past to rest. And the truth may hurt, but selective ignorance is fatal. It's fatal to the organization, it's fatal to the profession, and as we found out over the last year or so, not following the truth can be fatal to our democracy. And one of the truths that we have to acknowledge is that the American policing system is not broke. I hear that quite often, that is broke. I think the challenge is that the American policing system is operating exactly as it was designed for the purpose that it was originally designed. And that is to say, it is still rife with structural racism. It is still a system that has disparate impacts and outcomes that are not justified by crime or any other variable that people want to infuse in it. It is the system that was designed to enforce uh, discriminatory laws, Jim Crow laws. And some will argue on one side that the American system derives from Sir Robert Peel in 1829 with the first Metropolitan Police Department. But for people who quite frankly look like me and for communities of color, we believe the American policing system derives from slave patrols. And so this kind of dichotomy of understanding of the system means that what, what how we embrace it looks different. And so acknowledging that the system is very much operating the way it's supposed to then in order to change the system, we need to change the purpose of what it's about. That's where the public safety reform comes into play. Now, a lot of people say that when I say that, that that's uh, insult or that's attacking the officers. But once again, if, the, if we're talking about American policing system, then the fact that it has structural racism it is not to suggest that the vast majority of cops are racist. I spent 30 plus years in law enforcement, or third, close to 30 years in law enforcement. And I can say without hesitation, I strongly believe the vast majority of cops in this country are honorable men and women, they're selfless servants, they're committed to their profession, um, and they're trying to do what's right, and they're not racist. That's, I don't think they, that's even a question. Um, but the idea that they're operating on a system and a structure that is infused with it, and I just gave an example. And so when a system says that the only way to respond to crime and violence in the community is the saturation of that neighborhood by police, then it's a system that's very flawed. It's going to have disparate outcomes. So a city that's willing to pay a million dollars in overtime to saturate the streets, but doesn't want to pay a million dollars to start a jobs program, an education program to change some of the socioeconomic outcomes means that the police are already at a disadvantage because we're using the wrong tool for the for initial problem. So when I say that the system is suffering from structural racism, I, I want to be clear that I'm not attacking the men and women that serve in it. I'm actually suggesting that they're victims of that system as well, because they're forced to work. They're forced to work in a system that despite their best efforts gonna give them some terrible outcomes. And so if we're going to look at the next level, we're going to reform, then we need to acknowledge that and, and, and really 
look forward of how we're going to move, how we're going to move forward. And this is important because when we start talking about public safety reform, you hear the cries right now, everything from defunding to this idea of, um, you know, abolishment. And I think the key to that is that people are saying, I'm not going to take, take uh, privilege to speak for everybody, but from what I'm hearing a lot, that people are saying that they want to, the abolishment is not necessarily the abolishment of all police. I, I think most people recognize that it's not a practical solution that would be unsafe and to do arbitrary defunding is just something as a former police chief and I spent time as a city manager would have dire consequences if we to do that. But if the system is already flawed, and I think conceptually what people are saying is that we need to abolish that system and build a system based on a new vision of a public safety. So what should public safety look like? We know, for example, that the vast majority of calls, or not the vast majority, but a large amount of services or calls that officers are going to, really they're not qualified to respond or to handle. Probably one of the busy, biggest examples would be in the mental health field. And so we as a society in the 80s decided to deconstruct and defund mental health institutions. We then left no services available, so now that the default to that now goes to the police. We did the same thing with homelessness, the same thing with addiction. And the problem with engaging the police on those topics is when you take a social issue, use the police to respond to the problems that are created by that issue, you end up criminalizing that issue. So now homelessness becomes a crime. Addiction becomes criminalized. And mental health services are best provided inside of a jail. And so the greatest provider of mental health services in most states would be the county jail. And so we know we are over relying on police. The police know it, the community knows it. The question is, what are we supposed to do about it and how do we make that change? I think we have to start from square one. And in fact, there is a square one project with Yale University, I think has the concept right, is if we were to build a police department or a public safety scheme, what would it look like today? We need, communities need to identify what is the role, uh, what does public safety look like? Obviously public safety is not just crime. Public safety would be crime, it would be environmental issues, it would be education. Now we have a new idea, you had a whole day on it on pandemic or exposures to future pandemics. What does public safety look like? And then what is the role that all these, uh, these entities within government play in that scheme, if you will? And then once we do that, I think we'll have a clear role what the police should or should not do. And it's important to do that because then we can train them to that, hold them accountable to that. And I think we can then be able to make sure that we can divert resources or reallocate them to where they're most needed. And so when I look at public safety reform, I think it really is not about the police as much as it is about a community coming together and deciding this is what public safety is to us. This is how we want to see it. And here are the components. Now, a lot of cities right now are starting this reimagination or reimagining public safety process. Some cities are going straight to defunding. As I mentioned earlier, I would caution because when I was in the Oakland Police Department, it's about a $200, $300 million budget. If you took $100 million today and invested it into mental health services, for, for all of you on here, you know that it will take two or three years just for them to absorb that funding and to actually put it into work. It may take another two years for that work to have a return on the investment. So you just can't take $100 million and then, and, and then think that you're going to see services overnight. It takes time. It takes investments. And then it's going to take time for them to provi start providing clients the kind of services that would, def that would then decrease the need for the police to respond to begin with. An example would be, since we got rid of mental health services in the community, you down to hear stories where people may wait six months to see a doctor. They're not keeping on their medication. So now as a, as a society, we have deconstructed and defunding mental health services. People can no longer receive services or they have to wait months. They're not easily accessible to that medication and then they go to crisis. They go to crisis with no help and at two o'clock in the morning, the only thing people can pick up the phone and call of the police. Now, one of my 25 year old cops responds at two o'clock in the morning for something that we as a society have failed on and they now have to deal with a guy in crisis who's holding a knife. And then when the outcome is not what we want it to be, what we second guess it to be, then we say the officer needs more training.
And training is always great. And don't get me wrong, we need to de-escalate crisis intervention. But let's not lose track of what the core problem was to begin with, is that call should have never been generated in the first place. So we need to make those kind of investments so that we reduce the amount of people that are in a crisis, that we find shelters and find resolves for people so that it's not homelessness, so we don't get calls about trespassing. Once we do that and we start seeing the return on that investment, then I think you can start reducing the law enforcement footprint so that it matches now with the, with the actual duties or job that they're supposed to do. If we do it ahead of time, we do it too quick. Then while people are processing the money, while they are building up staff, while they're starting to provide services, all you've done was just cut the police department in half. And now you're still going to get those same calls with people in crisis, but you're going to have less people there to respond, which is going to put people at risk. And my concern for those who are really into the idea of reforming public safety, reforming policing as we know it, if we do it wrong, then we're going to do some harm. And like I said, like the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, it should be our first one. And it will be the harm to the point that many people would wanna basically reinvest back into police and even higher rates out of fear. So as we look forward, I think the role that your organization others can play is once we understand that these are systemic issues, that we need to reimagine public safety in a global point of view, then the question is, is how do we help agencies do that? Keeping in mind again, that there's 16,000 independent agencies with the vast majority being fewer than 50 sworn officers. And why that's important, that means their capacity to do research is limited. Their capacity to have an infrastructure or the technology to help them advance forward is limited, right? So there may have to be more collaborations at the regional level, more, more concepts or more creativity on how to, res how to respond to that. I think a couple of things that are needed immediately. One, as a profession, the policing system must start going back to the idea that we are a profession should be held to that standard. And what I mean by that is if, if a doctor were to do an, an operation or prevail to, or fail to provide you with some kind of treatment that's in a medical journal that research has shown works, that, that would be malpractice and they would lose their license. If you get convicted of a crime because your attorney didn't know the case law that suggested the search or the recovery of the evidence was illegal, you would be disbarred. But as a police chief, I can pretty much do anything I want to do and embrace any program, whether it caused harms or not, and simply say, hey, but it worked. A lot of people didn't go to jail and nothing happens to me. And in fact, the more temporary uh, success I get, the longer I may actually survive. We need to change that. And a perfect example would once again would be stop and frisk. If you look at the argument at the time with stop and frisk, that it worked. Now, I don't know what that meant when it says out of work, that if you saturate any corner, of course, you're going to stop people from moving or do anything, but you also restrict freedom. You violate the Constitution. And if we're going to decide that we're a constitutional based republic, then there's no exceptions. You know, we'll follow the Constitution, except when crime goes up. We'll respect and value the democracy, except when there's a spike in violence. And so we, we really, if we're gonna be a profession, we need to increase the amount of research we're doing to make sure that our strategies are evidence-based, that they're based on science and research, and that they cause no harm. We need to make sure that we're not using a hammer for everything that's a, that's a problem, because you know the phrase, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. So I think moving forward, what is really critical for me is a couple of things. One, recognizing that the American policing system is a system. And when we're going to talk about reform, talking about it as policing reform and the need to change the very systems to identify where it is still structurally unsound, where we're still seeing um, race, racial or racist practices, or at least practices that have the kind of disparate outcomes that would make a community feel that it's racist, that we need to make sure that in that system, that we have the right accountability mechanisms so that we're operating based on research and evidence and science, and that we're using technology to advance that and not just technology for the sake of technology. When I was talking to Maria about speaking, I, I was sharing her with a project that I work with with Stanford and Harvard on the policing and technology um, project. And it came up because technology is now advancing faster than the system is is advancing faster than policies, and you guys know better than I do, it's advancing faster than law. And so 
if you think about how police hired or procured uh, procured technology, it is really somewhat shocking, almost borderline shameful, that most of the technology that I embrace is I would go to a conference, like an international conference, and this is back before um, the pandemic, and I would go to the to the you know with a hall with the vendor hall, and they would have wine and cheese, and I'd ask wine, get some cheese, and the vendor would be like, hey, check out this technology, and it was cool, and it was great. I find a grant to get it, and I'd buy the technology before I had a clue of what it actually could do for me, or more importantly, have a clue what it would actually do against me, or or the things that I would need to know with my community from privacy to data collection. So I think right now, this, this idea of matching technology with this policing system is critical because what you can help with, for those that are in the private industry, for those that are building technology and working on solutions, is when you understand where the flaws in the system are at, then technology should help identify that. You can, so instead of being accused of, you know, technology being a solution in search of a problem, technology becomes a, a, a you know a, a problem that there is a problem that's identified and you become the solution, but you also can help identify problems before we see them. You can identify problems that we're not aware of. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know, and that you can help us present it in a way. I think it's technology that can do the connectivity, so that whether I have five officers or forty thousand, right, I still have connectivity so that I can learn from the best, learn from best practices, learn from research, and learn from what's going on around the country. But if we're going to collect a lot of data, then I would need some technology to help me analyze that data, not so I can simply just say I collected it, but that I can share it with the public in the most easy format that everyone has access to, that I can use it to actually change managerial practices and start dismantling that system that we're talking about, and that I can use it for transparency so that the community has access to it. I'm going to close that we started this process with the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And one of the things that came back into 2015, when President Obama put it together, if you recall, this was following the Ferguson tragedy with Michael Brown and the demonstration that then turned to riots. Then it was Eric Garner. Then it was a few other high profile cases. And the president wanted to put something together to be able to start that process of police and community coming together uh, while also making sure that we're still moving with the advancement of public safety. One of the things I would ask you to take a look at at that report, and as we move forward looking at our policing system, and as you look forward to what are some of the solutions, is that there were six pillars that Maria mentioned. I wanna bring my point to you that the first pillar was building trust and legitimacy, and pillar number six was officer safety and wellness. When we first started, some thought that officer safety and wellness had nothing to do with this, they wanted to know why we did this. But if you think about it, pillar one and pillar six are the bookends of policing reform in the United States. And what I mean by that is when we get ready to start, you will be able to say that on the first pillar, what first bookends is public trust and legitimacy. If the community has no trust and we are viewed as not being legitimate, nothing can work with regards to public safety. We may get some statistical ups and downs throughout the years, but real sustainable going to the root issues of crime will not be addressed. At the same time, pillar six, the other bookend, is also safety and wellness. If we don't take care of our people that are putting their lives on the line every day for us, for the system, nothing can work as well. So within those two book holds is the issue of data collection, technology, social media, training, and all the other parts of the system. So as we move forward, I look for your organization and others like you to really, you know, I won't say step up because you've been you've been in this ring for over 20 years, but to really make yourself more visible to the industry. So to help us achieve what's been elusive for the last 50 years, and that is real sustainable reform that is more than just putting Band-Aids on a system that uh, people think are broke, but to recognize that the system is not broke from an operational point of view, it's broke from a design point of view. And if we were in business, a private business, we would enter some kind of business process redesign. So what we need now in American policing in order to get to a new vision of public safety is a business process redesign. And I think your organization, your leadership would be significant in helping us redesign it because we're gonna to have to redesign this thing while we're still providing day-to-day -day services. So as they said, we're gonna to have to fix the plane while it's in the air and that's tough. With that, I'm gonna be quiet now and I look forward to you guys' questions. But once again, thank you so much and I look forward to working with you.
over here, so many notes, and I know that I can see this video over and over again. Uh, but I think that I want to be the president of your fan club. I think I have several groupies that will join me. Um, I I loved the reference to Pat Murphy. Uh, I actually worked at the Police Foundation way back when with Hubert Williams and everybody else. So those were my mentors as well. I loved then, and I think it's so appropriate now, the distinction and the reference to the profession versus the vocation. Because if you remember when we were doing all the community-oriented policing, that was the issue. You know, what? Do, how do we even professionalize it, right? We all had the conversation that we should, but then the issue was how do you even do that? So I'm going to go back to the how. Uh, the distinction and the bridges between the police reform versus the policing reform, I love, uh, let alone the notion of the, prof the, the roots of policing then need to be examined in order to understand why we are where we are and why we're doing things perhaps inappropriately. Uh, all of that is phenomenal. I mean, again, I, I can't even, I love even the BPR stuff. I've just got my, my uh, scribblings all over the place. Uh, the how to's, however, let me give you a question that then I'm sure we'll get questions from the office as, uh, from the participants as well. The how to's on what I think is your fundamental recommendation that we can't fix it until we understand uh, the design of where we want to go. And I understand the BPR will support the transition, but just how do we get to, and who do you include in such a discussion that would bring the correct parties together in order to uh, more professionalize uh, the, the institution uh, to understand that this is the root of the problem, uh, to codify it. How do you do that? And I mean, there, there's many different thoughts that come to mind, uh, but mine don't matter a tenth as much as yours do. So please give me, if you wouldn't mind, your perspective on that. Well, well thank you for the question. I, I think this first part of professionalizing it is one of the biggest challenges, you know, Maria, we, from my, my time, your time, is, we've been banging our heads on this. <laughs> And, and so I think a couple of things. Most recently, I did a project with the U.S. Conference of Mayors on police reform and racial justice. And a part of that was identifying some of the obstacles. So one is we, we really have to go back to get most for police to understand this. We're still operating where many most departments, not most departments, a lot of officers think that right now they feel under siege. They don't feel appreciated. And I understand why. And so they think, for example, when you say structural racism, there's an immediate defense field that says, did you just call me a racist? And to get them to understand the historical, look, I have three kids that are all pretty much old enough to be cops. Mm -hmm. And that generation does not embrace history as much as we would like them to do so. So part of it would be educating officers on the history of policing in the United States, right? Some years ago, we started training with the Holocaust Museum and the Museum of Tolerance with officers around the country so they can understand how words matter, how, how how things can lead to the kind of horrific things that we saw there, I think to be able to do some kind of historical training for also, let's say, for example, at the Smithsonian's African American Museum or any local museum that walks them through the civil rights struggle, but it takes them from, you know, slavery through reconstruction to Jim Crow laws to understand that we start looking at the civil rights struggle, that when you're going into a house and for someone that's my age at 57 or older, that they can remember uh, some of the, 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 the roles that police have played. So that's one is to get them to see the historical. Some departments have, and it was, um, I think it's David, uh, what's David's, well, he's gonna kick my butt, the National Network for Safe Communities, David um, Kennedy. Yes. That started a program I think makes sense. And that is when the chiefs and people acknowledge to the community, look, most recently a chief did this and I won't apologize to you for the historical context and what has happened. And in fact, our department was a part of a lynching that we never stood account for. So I wanna acknowledge it, he apologized for it, because going back to that Mandela quote, only the truth can put the past to rest. So I would say to start this discussion, we can turn to South Africa and learn that that truth and reconciliation process can be applied, which we have not done in the United States. So because we have not done reconciliation, we keep trying to revise history and pretending it never occurred. The other part would be is to take a look at our operational systems and start redefining. We redefine the role of the police. The biggest thing that contributes to some of the systemic deficiencies that exist 
is this issue of crime and violence reduction. And what I mean by that is when a chief's success or failure, his or her job relies on a crime rate, then you're going to get exactly what you've, what you've bargained for, which is a desire to use enforcement to resolve everything because my job's on the line. In Baltimore, the chief was there, was got fired in six months, saying that the homicide rate didn't go down fast enough. Now, that ignores the fact that you have an unemployment rate that's over 20 percent, that you have border houses at almost 30 percent of the city, that you're sitting there in an economic situation borderline at poverty levels, that the educational system has a high dropout rate. And so you forget all of that and simply say, chief, you didn't do it fast enough, which means the next chief's going to make sure I do it fast. And the only way to do it fast is to do it inappropriately, which is to start saturating communities, low-income communities, where they're going to be primarily of color with cops. And that means you're going to have a lot of stops, disparate treatment, violations of the constitutions, criminalizing social issues. And that leads from the first bookend, you lose trust and legitimacy. So I think to get to that point is make sure that we understand our history, make sure that we hold officers accountable and the department accountable for what they role they play. They should be a lead role. They should be problem solvers, but they should be co-producers of public safety in the community and not just everybody defer to them for crime and violence. So you would, and just using your, um, I'm going to the next steps as in, if you educate not only the, the audience entire, uh, from a structural program perspective, I wonder if there wouldn't be value to educate select leaders that then could, uh, with some uh, structured path and development of curriculum, uh, educate the leaders that you want to see throughout the nation. Because I think what becomes problematic, even from me trying to figure out a program that could help uh, uh, constitute this, uh, and really not just for IDIS to do, because this has to be something that is uh, multi-pronged and brings extraordinary partners to the table. My thought is that um, often many of us have had discussions with regard to leaders. We need true leaders to own the issues and to understand that it's complex and to usher the solution. And if we have a pocket in one city on the Northeast or the Southwest or all these different individual pockets, that's not changing our world. And we may not be alive to see the difference. Uh, how to jumpstart that is certainly your education of what's happening. I wonder if then seeding a group of leaders to sort of promulgate and evangelize and then bringing them in in order to contribute to that redefinition process and then that BPR process that then codifies it might be, you know, the whiteboard in my head. The whiteboard's over there, but the whiteboard in my head might actually work out. No, I think you have it exactly right. And as you know, um, and I think this is where the federal government can help greatly. And what I mean by that is you're talking, I think right now, Maria has made up to about $4 billion in different grants and programs from OJP, Yes. to cops office. And if done right, what you do is you make strategic investments in those grants so that you can't fund 16,000 agencies like we would like to, yes. but you can definitely fund them based on size, geography, so that they're representative of the field. Almost like if you were doing a, a, a survey sampling so that there's examples so that you can see that. The other thing is in, in England, they have a police college. And I know before I left the cops office, I submitted this to the budget it, and the president, President Obama put it in the budget. It was a it was an idea that we could create not so much a one college, but work with uh, academia to develop a master's of science and yeah, yeah, yeah. and that you could have cohorts of, of up and coming leaders go there. And here's what they would end up learning. So now you would have a group of future leaders and the future could be with the, they'll be chiefs within the next two or three years that would learn about the history of policing. They would learn about science and about data and about problem solving and about all the things that, I mean, a global educational program, walk away with a master's degree, do a their, their thesis or their intern at DOJ where they're working on specific projects and would be published. Imagine after two or three years of 50, 60, 100 leaders now that are taking the, the helm of these departments that are thinking more along the lines of research and evidence, understanding the history, appreciating a, an academic police department partnership, understanding the role of technology and privacy and law. I mean, it would be creating a new generation. And I say that with the utmost respect for this generation because I do believe in the next panel, you have some of my heroes on there, that we have some of the strongest and some of the best evolution of police chiefs in the country. 
Um, but we still got to, we should never stop. We just got to keep going. And so we can use that, as you mentioned, that strategic investment with the Department of Justice leading the way. As I used to tell the, uh, the appropriators, you'll appreciate this, without getting into politics, there was always, you know, for some reason, the cops office received support from one side of the aisle where it was always being attacked from the other side of the aisle. And part of the argument was, is that it's not the federal government's role to supplant local police or local budgets. Now, the argument I made that makes more and more sense is, if you like the decentralized method of policing, if you like law enforcement to be at the local level, once again, the vast majority being less than 50, then it's not the federal government's role to supplant local budget, but the federal government has the most critical role in ensuring that well, you can maintain that system because you have to make sure that whether I got two officers or two deputies, that I have access to the same evidence, research, information, right, as if I was NYPD or Chicago PD. If I don't, then where I go in this country, my treatment is going to vary significantly. And unfortunately, sometimes that occurs. So it's, it's, to our, it's, it's to our benefit to make sure through the federal government investments, through the use of technology, and even outside of the cities, that there's that connectivity, that's that sharing information, so that we can start holding chiefs accountable. When I hear chiefs talk about they still want to do the, the DARE program, when I think there's research that says that it actually had counterproductive results, then that would be like you know, a doctor saying they want to do some kind of surgery that everybody says don't do anymore. Right. You would not expect that. So tell me, in order for you at your level, and I, I refer to that you're doing the vision or you're in your uh, contribution, you're seeing the national perspective and the, the progression over time and the time that it will take. Uh, what data, and I'm thinking about our, our members and how they would want to certainly contribute to this, uh, what data are you lacking in order to sus substantiate some of these discussions? Meaning we can definitely speak to, and again, different partners could speak to the inconsistencies or the lack of availability of the real data or the, uh, the real time data. What is it that you, from a visionary perspective, so it's really a, 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 it's a, it's a view backwards and it's a view forwards, what are you lacking in order to help you make this argument, help you deliver this argument? Yeah, that, that's great. I think a couple of things. I, I would take a look at, for example, the, a police chief who says, I want to do this. And then the question is, is what information or data and evidence is there to, to, for this person to be able to do so without being attacked politically, right? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this, Chief? So right. one would be is we need more evidence-based strategies to reduce crime, right? We have folks deterrent. We have operation ceasefire. So can you, can, is there data that would just show that using a public health model to reduce violence, looking at some of the evidence-based programs that exist are more effective and have least, less harm so that when a chief goes to this strategy, there's research and evidence. Is there evidence to show that when you have increased legitimacy based on your interactions with the community and based on the relationship that, 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 and taking care of the cops, that crime will go down, uh, is not affected other than going down, that you see reductions in complaints, that you see reductions in litigation. And so I think there's gotta be the data to show that the things that we're advocating for other than sounds good and feels good is actually good. And I yes. think that's where the data comes in is to, is to take it from feel good to actual, which is, you know, if you're going to do a problem solving method, then like, for example, when I was a police chief, I had a officer that was killed within my first six months in the line of duty by a young man on parole. The family, however, had a simple question for me. Chief, why would a guy three months out of jail still be walking the streets with the gun? Was there no help for him? Mm -hmm. So we ended up doing a reentry program. We got some pilot legislation so that the Department of Correction would start a reentry program. And once again, the evidence, everybody thought I was crazy. Now, my backing was that the family had the vision and had the courage to say, we want a different solution, not just take all these guys to jail. But when we put the program in there, our recidivism rate went from the 70% to 14%. Our violence went down, crime went down. So now the argument would be, when it came time to fund it outside the state, is instead of filling three or four positions, I turned that into cash to be able to pay for street outreach workers, the reentry program, because the return on the investment was clearly better than just adding more cops, although my cops were tremendous and did a great job. But without that data, without that information, it, you know, and, and in this case, without the first two or three million dollars from the state so that my city didn't go crazy, 
I never would have been able to do it. So we need to provide financial support for people to try creative ideas. We need to back that with research and evidence. We need to build, we need to make sure what impact it has on systems. And probably the biggest issue would be in technology is to really then understand, you know, how technology can help, not just help because it's cool, like I told you when I went to go over there, but to help because it's more efficient, it's more transparent, and it take and, it, and it's more uh, effective, if you will. But we also have to make sure that it, there's no surprises with the technology. I'm also a city that had ShotSpotter, and it's very good. Now I have no complaints for ShotSpotter; did a great job. But it also, it also, but you got to start asking questions about the data, who owns it, how you do it. Now, once I understood everything that it could collect, I got with uh, the CEO, and and we worked it out to where we had the data. I could publicize it publicly. So it's just knowing the right questions to ask and make sure vendors are responsive like they were so right. that whatever data collects, you can manage and control and protect the community. Right, I can, I can respond at, confidently in that the service providers absolutely want to be part of the solution and to enable whatever needs or flexibility that any of its constituents want. So uh, the shot spotter example is not surprising to me. Uh, it's understanding your needs in order to facilitate, say that data you want to be able to share with the community. And that bridge sharing with the community is one that is so often lacking, partly because of that institutional definition, partly because it's such a heavy lift, partly because of financial issues or resource issues. But in some ways, it's our it's our Achilles heel, right? It's where we where we're going to get tripped up because we're not sharing. Now, if I can talk say, with you. I'm yeah. sorry. If I can say this, I would think if, if I there are some things, for example, that you can sit down with the expert and go, here's my vision. One day I want to do this. Right. Right. That person, they like an architect. They can come back and here's your first drawing. I think with technology is the challenge would be for the service providers is to once again, when you understand the system, understand when the communities work with us, the local communities, once they redefine or reimagine public safety, that this is what we want it to be. They're now giving you a vision of where they want to get to. This is where your technological skills and creativity can really kick in and say, OK, well, Here's a process to get there. Here's where technology can help. Here's where it doesn't help. Here's where people come together. You know, um, even a process for design who the stakeholders are going to be. Right. You know, one of the biggest things now I would tell any police chief is the co-production of public safety takes us out of our comfort zone because that requires power sharing, right? Not just going to a community, but actually giving up some of your power. Right, absolutely. Right. So I could speak to you for hours, but I should throw in a question or two from the audience or they'll eat me alive later. So we've got one from Ben Bowden that's uh, right in front of me. So many great points, Director. Um, such complex challenges, but so critical to, continu to continually address. With so many opportunities for strategic investments by federal agencies, and those are the references you made to OJP and COPS and others, to generate evidence, where would you recommend near-term investment focus by the new administration? What would you proceed as sort of the first and second issues? Yeah, the, I, I think the first issue would be is to address this issue of, is to help cities do the issue of reimagining public safety. So I'm gonna pick on Houston because I know you got Art Acevedo coming yes, up. Here, right? So Art's a very creative and progressive guy and I know you got Carmen on there because she was in Seattle, is to say, hey, you know, instead of giving you $10 million in COPS grant, I'll give you a COPS grant, but I'll let you use it the way you want to, not just hiring COPS, because what you may want to do is now use it to start that reimagination process to make some initial investment, maybe a pilot it in a district or part of the area. Let's see what happens if we make an investment and see if we can measure the impact that investment has. So before I start defunding, reallocating or anything, I can do it based on some evidence and some idea what the future looks like. So anything that can help that process. What I don't think we should do is we have to be careful and just just, just going back to the way we used to do it. And a lot of the ways we fund is not necessarily based on evidence and science because it is a political process, as you know, we're ready to get the funding and what they want it for. So I would say the immediate turn would be is funding the the, the idea of policing reform and, and, and redefining or reimagining public safety and, and, and doing pilot sites, to your point, strategically around the country so that the rest of the 16,000 agencies and communities can see and learn and, and not take the kind of risk that some of them are taking right now. Wonderful, and I'll give you one or two more. 
Uh, if we could hang on to you. For, one from Roger Mann, Director Davis, please comment on the progress and contribution in education and training provided by experts such as uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, Eberhardt in Oakland and Bobby Kippers uh, actively caring for policing. Right. Bobby, so how I, can I just help? Yeah, I, have no, I don't know Dr. Uh, I know Dr. Eberhardt very well out of Stanford. And I think her contribution has been tremendous, nothing less than miraculous. And in that, it, it took a debate, and you remember this debate, Maria, going back 20 years ago to whether or not we should collect data. Then we went to, okay, now we collected data and everybody had a bunch of stop data forms sitting in their, in their back storage room and no one and analyzed the data. Right. And then when they analyzed the data, there was a debate about the benchmarking and what do you compare it to? And then once you get to that point, well, now that you made that, what does all this mean to me as a police chief other than something to attack me for with regards to racial disparities? What Jennifer has done, I think, and in, in what the research has shown now is that they're now collecting data that is part of their CompStat process in Oakland, that they actually are accountable for trying to manage their process, evaluating what may be causing the disparities. As a result, their stops have kind of transcended the issue of this random stops to investigatory stops, kind of a higher standard that there's gotta be some reason for it. They also did something recently that Jennifer did, which was amazing is she looked at body camera, which going back to the technology, and not just because there's a complaint or because there was a shooting, but looked at the interaction between the officers and the community. And what we ended up finding out is that there were differences based on color. And so when the officer is talking to a young man of color, issues like, hey dude, what's up man, kind of thing, versus when they're not, it was a different kind of conversation, more likely to have you know things like sir or ma'am. Um, and, and so the question would be, what does this mean for officers? Talk to the officers, some of them, because they're not very culturally competent, think that they're actually trying to de-escalate talking a language. That means that you have a very negative stereotype about how black folk talk. But anyway, yeah. to educate them on that and to realize that, you know, sir works across the board. Don't worry, you can never go wrong with sir or ma'am. And to let people see that it doesn't become discipline, but it comes a way of changing behavior. So I think any program and training that is done based on the science and research that is likely to affect behavior, right? Or even make awareness as significant. So, if, and I just I have to say this, there's this research right now, there's a debate whether implicit bias training works. One thing I will make very clear though, is for those in academia, as well as those in the service provision is, I rarely question the methodology of research or, or process three design. I do question in many cases, the research question itself. Right. So with implicit bias, if the question is, does it change implicit bias? Well, I don't need a one year study to tell me no. You think? That was never the goal for most chiefs. Right. The question is, does it make the officer aware of it? Does it explain to him or her now why I want to collect the data, why I'm going to evaluate, why my practices and systems may look different without attacking you? That would be the benefit for me, right? And so when I, or same thing with community policing, I've seen studies that so does community policing work and then community policing versus enforcement. Well, your research question is flawed right. because enforcement is a part of community policing. What you did was just admit, compare community engagement or community program to enforcement. And anyone that tells you a community program is going to reduce crime by itself, well, that's also pretty self-explanatory. So part of it is, is when you are developing these processes, when you're doing the research, you got to bring experts in like on your next panel to make sure, not your methodology, but to make sure your starting point, your construct, your research question is the right one. And I think then we can get to some of the better outcomes that we're talking about. And you may have revisited some of these same points, but what would your parting messages to us be? To our community, to our needs, to your priorities, to the vision for the future, anything that you would like to sort of wrap? Um, in an yeah, I, I would just say this, this is, this is one of those unique moments in history. In my 30 plus years, that's going back to Rodney King. I've, I mean, I can think of every point throughout history that has sparked some demands for reform. This one is a little, to me, is a little bit different. I don't think these are moments now. I think we have a short window at a movement, a short opportunity where everyone sees the need for change. The police see it. Now, and so the, the, the community sees it, elected officials see it. The issue of criminal justice reform is bipartisan. So while we have a captive audience, now more than ever, we need that creative thinking, that, that, that evidence and science and service providers 
to bring people to the table while they're willing to come to the table and to have the discussion. Let's not get locked up and lost in terms, defunding, abolishment, look beyond the term and look at what people are trying to achieve. And when we do that, we'll have more in common than we could ever imagine and start from that place. But you guys are kind of the neutral, you could be in many ways cases a neutral arbitrator of just bringing you know, process and facts and science in to help people bridge that gap. But I think this is my, my thing, I'm optimistic more so than I've been because, and I'm, I'm biased, so I'll say this, because we have an administration that's gonna make this a priority. Thank God. With the president and vice president and the team he's putting together with DOJ is truly amazing. We have a unique opportunity and we have law enforcement leaders like you have in your next panel that can make it work. So add this to IGIS and, and the whole idea of search providers. Wow, we can actually do some pretty great things in the next five years without a doubt. I, if I was not on camera, I would be hooting and hollering because I think this was extraordinary. I cannot thank you enough. I know from the comments that are way over there that they are all very positive as well. And we are all so very grateful for you spending some time with us. Um, you'll probably regret having given us your email address because that's something that I will be using in the future because there's so many ideas and so many concepts. And as you started to lead into our next town hall with Peter Harvey, uh, with Art Azevedo, with Carmen Best, with Jim Birch, all individuals that then have not only uh, the same sort of experiences, but a different perspectives because of their own uh, either jurisdictions or or incidents that they have been part of. And they come from uh, not only the federal perspective, the local perspective. Uh, Jim now, even though he was uh, director at BJA too, uh, comes now from the police foundation perspective, bringing in the research, et cetera. So uh, I think that this too will be an evolution uh, that will lead to so many different possibilities. So again, I thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And to all the participants, please join us at uh, the next hour, I want to say at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, where we will be having that uh, reform panel. Uh, and we appreciate any and all comments uh, on the window. So thank you so much, folks. Bye-bye now.